I'm enormously honoured to be here to join your celebration of United Nations Day. The UN Australia Association has been in existence since 1946 and the efforts you lead to ensure a more informed, peaceful, prosperous, livable, resilient and modern multicultural Australian society are just as important now as they were then. I'll take this opportunity to offer some reflections on the role of universities, including my own, UNSW, in making the world a better place for everyone. That's a simple enough phrase, making the world a better place for everyone. But as those associated with the UN would know, it's also the toughest of missions to take on. Our world resists both organisation and simplification. It grows more complex every day. We face a paradox in the times we live in. Vastly more information, technologies that dazzle us with their speed and efficiency, medical breakthroughs that improve and extend our lives, whilst, sadly, for much of humanity, life has become more hectic, more anxious, and more uncertain, and the inequalities in society ever greater. If we reflect back to when the, UN, the United Nations was shaped in San Francisco in 1945, much of the world was in ashes. Cities and nations needed rebuilding, and there was a real threat that another war, a nuclear war, would end civilization. The alternative was to make the world a better place for everyone and to create an international forum where differences between nations could be aired and responsibilities shared and peacekeeping could perhaps replace conflict. The UN embodied those ideals and for all its struggles and setbacks for over half a century, it's played a role in reducing armed conflict and improving the lives of millions. We can be grateful to those visionaries of 1945 and to all the Australians who have served the UN and other multilateral organisations as peacekeepers over the past 69 years, who we remembered with pride and thanks at the Cenotaph earlier today. Around the same time, another great vision was taking hold, with the same mantra, to make the world a better place for everyone, the belief that universal education could lift humankind out of this perpetual struggle and away from conflict and misery. And we saw in the post-war boom of prosperity the rise of what became known as the new universities. The first European universities in Bologna in 1088, in Paris 1150, at Oxford 1167, started as a community of teachers and scholars. But they evolved into elite institutions that offered little hope of entry for the children of any but the rich or well-connected. That changed. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Britain and America with so-called red brick universities in major cities, opening up higher education to students of different social status, to women, to the needs of local communities, to answer not only the profound philosophical and scientific questions, but to address the immediate problems of society. The trend towards these new universities, funded largely by government, took off worldwide after 1945 and it accelerated rapidly in the 60s and 70s. Even the old elite universities became open to all and many more young people from all backgrounds to access the benefits university education can provide. Like many of you here today, I was one of those people as the first in my family to go to university. And in Australia, UNSW Sydney is perhaps the prime example. We began in 1949 as the New South Wales University of Technology with the aim of building an institution that would carry forward the profound developments in human knowledge and concern that have produced such exemplars as the Massachusetts Institute of Technology focused on teaching and research in science and technology but also exploring the humanities, social sciences, economics and politics. 67 years of dynamic growth later, UNSW maintains that mixture of sustained innovation, deep scholarship, and practical application of results. Last year, we embarked on our 2025 strategy, a 10-year plan aimed at placing us amongst the top 50 of the 25,000 plus universities in the world. But more importantly, through that, as Australia's global university, having a major positive impact through our social engagement and global priorities in the communities we serve, locally, nationally, and beyond Australia's borders. Universities are complex organisations, not as complex perhaps as the UN, but still very large in their scope and ambitions and in their daily operations. UNSW has 
around 6,000 staff and more than 50,000 students, which makes it around the same size in numbers as Australia's Defence Forces. Some universities around the world are even larger. Some have enrolments into the hundreds of thousands. As they grow, universities can easily become entities unto themselves, inward looking and competing with each other for resources and students and staff, leading to the common accusation that they are ivory towers and not a part of the real world. That's a danger for all large institutions and something that runs contrary to what I believe universities should be about. As the world faces unprecedented challenges, universities are expected to fill many roles. They're seen by government as providers of professionals and creators of wealth, drivers of innovation. They're expected to help solve the world's problems, including economic crisis. It's worth noting that we do contribute enormously to economic growth. Last year, we produced a report with Deloitte showing that Australian universities, through the research and ideas they push out into society, contributed $160 billion to Australian GDP. Amazingly, that's 10% of our national GDP. That's important, but universities are about much, much more than that. They're built around people, and human capital is the main product of universities. Ultimately, it's that human capital which will make the world a better place for everyone. At UNSW, our strategy incorporates, along with the pursuit of academic excellence in education and research, and the use of that for economic benefit, two activity strands every bit as important, which take us directly out into the world. Social engagement and global impact. I believe that great universities are servants of their society. Servants of their society and of the global community. A hallmark of that is playing a major role and an active role in transforming humanity for the better. A great university does not stop at the edge of campus. It links seamlessly with the surrounding society and is in turn influenced and shaped by that society and its needs. Universities should be role models for the communities they serve displaying transparency and openness, providing a platform, encouraging freedom of thought and expression and a wide di diversity of views. Universities should reach out and help, just as on a far broader scale, the United Nations does so. Certainly, UNSW often feels like a smaller version of the United Nations. We have around 14,000 international students from well over 100 nations and partnerships with over 400 universities in 39 countries. Recently, we've joined with King's College London and Arizona State University to form the PLUS Alliance, PLUS for Phoenix, London and Sydney universities, to maximise our global reach and impact. We're developing new technologies to make that happen, including, importantly, online learning, which will give access to literally millions who otherwise could not obtain higher education. What matters in this effort is of course the knowledge acquired through education and research, but equally the application of that knowledge to the real world. To that end, we've established at UNSW an Institute for Global Development, and we've set ourselves the challenging goal over the next decade of improving the lives of at least one million people in the South Pacific, in Asia, in Myanmar, and on the other side of the world in Uganda. Already our efforts in the developing world include over 250 projects in public health care, climate science, energy and water, sexual and reproductive health, mental health, AIDS, HIV, defence and security, post-conflict trauma and migration. So we are acting, directly engaging with the world and we're getting on with it. We've also set up a programme of grand challenges for debate, discussion and thought leadership on the big issues that are dominating the global agenda. Currently, we're focusing on two. Our climate change grand challenge, led by Professor Matt England, and our migration and refugees grand challenge, led by Professor Jane McAdam. Today, I'd like to refer in particular to the second of these, to refugees. The most graphic representation of the troubles currently facing the world and of the vulnerability of our existing social and political systems. According to UNHCR, in 2015, there were more than 60 million people in the world uprooted from their homes by conflict and persecution. 
Two thirds of them are internally displaced. The rest have fled their countries seeking asylum. To put that in starker terms, last year, over 30,000 people were forced to flee their homes every single day. And there's no indication things will improve. Syria, Iraq, Ukraine, and large swathes of Africa are in the grip of protracted conflict. And people are disconnected from their families, their cultures, and they are desperate. This is not only the great moral conflict of our times, but is having, as we've seen recently in Europe, profound effects on the fabric of established and well-developed societies. It's bringing out the best in the people, and alas, sometimes the worst. Many of us were deeply moved to see television news images of the women in the Greek island of Lesbos giving sanctuary to Syrian refugees, making their way across the Aegean from Turkey. The fact that the women were Orthodox Christians and the refugees mostly Muslim did not matter. What few of us realised was that the parents and grandparents of these same Greek women had themselves fled from Turkey almost 100 years ago, also as refugees. And what almost nobody realised was that some of the Greek refugees from Turkey had fled not westward but eastward and were cared for in Damascus by Syrians. On grand challenges like this, I believe that universities can and should play a greater role. Our resources can have massive impacts on the lives of refugees, whether in medicine or crisis management, in international law, in language teaching, and even philosophy. The nature of empathy, prejudice, and the acceptance of others cause as much for our attention as do more practical issues around resettlement, education, and employment. By engaging directly with refugees and adopting a hands-on approach to their problems, universities will not only be making the world a better place by transferring knowledge to those who need it most. They will be developing their own human capital and becoming finer institutions in the process. Today in the world, we see less and less consensus. In a world of 24-7 news cycles, the notion of the future has been replaced by a daily scramble to win popular approval and stay in power. Is it any wonder that electorates across the world are becoming more fickle, less trusting of polit the political establishment. Who talks of 10 or 20 year plans anymore? Could universities working with organizations like the UN and the UNAA take us away from that cycle of cynicism and mistrust and become a direct force for change in the way society operates? I, for one, passionately believe we can. But for that to happen, we need to open a wider door to the world so that everything we do will have social value and global impact. The university acting as a servant of society. And we need to constantly monitor what we're doing and ask ourselves what the world needs to move forward in troubled times. That is, I believe, the hallmark of a forward-looking 21st century university. At UNSW, we've begun that long journey with our 10-year plan, shifting from what is to get to what could be and working out the best ways to translate that into real benefits for all of humanity. Not to go there would be a great failure of the imagination that has brought us this far.